Hey guys, welcome back to Ostrich Investing. Today we're going to take a look at Macquarie Infrastructure. Uh, the stock price fell about 40% earlier this year, but has since recovered somewhat. I read an article with a long thesis that suggested it could be an attractive investment based on the dividend yield, which is 8.5% currently, and significant recent insider buying. So I wanted to take a look. So Macquarie Infrastructure uh, owns infrastructure assets across four divisions, including Atlantic Avi Aviation, which provides fuel, terminal, and aircraft hangaring at 70 locations across the US. Uh, that's about 34% of their EBITDA, you can see here. IMTT uh, operates bulk liquids terminal and storage business, and that's in the US and Canada. And that is about half of their EBITDA. And then they've got two other divisions, MIC Hawaii, which is the natural gas utility in Hawaii, and Contracted Power, uh, which has some renewable energy assets uh, that account for the remaining, uh, call it 20% of their EBITDA. So that's the business. Let's jump into taking a look at their stock price chart. So after, over the last five years, you can see leading up to February of this year, it was a fairly stable stock. I mean, outside of uh, this right here at the beginning of 2016, it looks like trending upwards, fairly stable. Uh, and then the bottom fell out in February of this year. So we'll definitely take a look at that. Um, the share price dropped to about a low of $37. Now it's since recovered up to 47. Uh, but nowhere close to sort of the highs that it had just just last year of a, of a little over eighty dollars a share. So it's come off from eighty, uh, went down a little bit below forty, and I was crept back up, closing in on fifty dollars a share. Dividend is four dollars a share currently per year. So the video is going to look at the financial overview, uh, take a look at recent news. Uh, provide a discussion on evaluation, and then we'll conclude with uh, some key considerations for the stock. So let's jump into it. We'll start with the financial overview, and for that we'll jump into the annual report, or the 10K. I believe it's on page 59. There we go. So they give us a great five-year history uh, of select financial data. So let's first take a look at the top line. Revenue growing from a little over a billion in 2013 to 1.8 billion in 2017. Uh, now some of the notes below indicate that not all of that growth has been organic, but still top line is moving well. Um, again, a billion to 1.8 over five years uh, is, is pretty nice revenue growth. And we'll figure out how much of that is organic versus acquisition. Net income, however, the picture is a lot more, it's a lot muddier. Uh, we'll have to dissect the results to really get a picture because it's jumping around all over the place. Uh, 28 million in 2013 to a billion in 2014. Now there's a note there that a big part of that is, is a fair value gain related to them acquiring the remaining 50% ownership, sorry, there it is, in IMTT. Uh, so non-cash uh, fair value gain uh, to a loss in 2015, then 150 million back to a profit of 150 in 2016, and then finally 456 million in 2017. So it's jumped around a lot. Uh, last point I'll note on the 456, you can see here there's a big tax benefit. Uh, so that most likely relates to uh, the corporate income tax reduction and uh, they've received a, probably a one-time benefit there. Shares outstanding, a little bit below here. Uh, you can see shares outstanding have, have almost doubled over the five-year period. So 51 million shares in 2013 to 91 million shares in 2017. And dividends. Dividends have also grown nicely. You can see 335, uh, 335, $3.35 in 2013 to $5.56 most recently. 
Interesting point here. We know from our first look at the stock that the current dividend is $4 a share. Uh, and they paid out 556 last year. So that would imply a dividend cut, uh, which I think we'll find later on when we get into their recent results. And then I think the last point that I want to make here is long-term debt. So long-term debt has jumped from a little under a billion in 2013 to three and a half billion in 2017. So, uh, currently three and a half billion dollars of debt uh, relative to the size of the business okay with respect to a detailed review there's two key details i want to talk about more in depth number one is uh, the management fee structure in the business and the second is funding the dividend so let's let's start with the management fee structure uh, one of the first things that when i when i went to the investor relations website one of the first things that caught my attention was download the MIC fee primer um, which sort of caught me and suggested to me that this is likely an externally managed uh, entity and sure enough it is so I opened it up and I went through it um, not in a ton of detail I'll start off by saying that I uh, I, uh, I really hate these arrangements. I, you know, as a shareholder or owner of the business, I expect management to work for the business business and not the other way around. These are these agreements tend to reduce profits that would otherwise flow to shareholders. Uh, and they can also create misalignment between management and investors. So with that out of the way, I, I, I jumped into it and Ultimately here, there's a combination of a base management fee and then a performance fee. The base management fee, is, a big driver is the market value of MIC stock. And then the incentive fee or the performance fee um, relates to their performance or outperformance relative to their um, peer group index. So those are sort of the two key drivers of how the fee is calculated. But if we go back just to our financial overview, you can see here, they actually break out the fees paid to the manager as a line item, and you can see how significant it is. In fact, over the last three years, there's, I wanna say $500 million of fees paid in the last three years, with 354 million of fees paid in 2015. And the 2015 one is one that really grabs your eye because they paid out 354 million in fees and actually drove the business to a net loss. So uh, really, <laughs> a red flag goes up. I mean, that's uh, there, there's something that doesn't pass muster there. Um, so 500 million in fees. The other thing to note is that most of these payments are actually made through the issuance of shares. So you're getting diluted as a shareholder as you go. Uh, part, of the, part of the payment is in cash, but I think this, uh, the majority of the payment is through issuance of, stair, of shares. And if we jump to note 11 of the financial statements, they talk about related party transactions. And without going through it in detail, it does break out the fees paid, the cash fees paid, which it shows here. And it also breaks out the shares issued, the fees. So you can look back in 2015 and see that there are millions of shares being issued in performance fees. But simply, the related party transaction note is almost four pages long. So as an investor, there it is. You know, a four page long related party transactions note would suggest to me we need to be cautious and careful around making sure that everyone is aligned uh, and uh, moving in the same direction. So the next key piece that I wanted to talk about was funding the dividend. So if we go to page 113, which 
is the cash flow statement. So if we pull up the cash flow statement, this is this is usually a pretty good simple trick just to, to run some quick math on whether the dividend is sustainable, uh, you know, and payout ratio, whether um, the dividend is reasonable and we can expect it to continue going forward. It's, it's a very quick way to do uh, the math around it. So if you look at cash flow from operations, it's the first piece we're going to look at. Then we're going to subtract uh, capital expenditures. And that's going to leave us with what we'll call our free cash flow number. And we're going to then compare that to the dividends paid, which is down here. So if we run the quick math for 2017, cash flow from operations was 530 million, capital expenditures were 340 million. That leaves us with about 189 million in free cash flow. So 189 million in free cash flow, and that compares to dividends paid of 453 million dollars. So obviously the dividends far exceeded the free cash flow generated by the business in 2017. If you actually run the same calculation for 2016, similar result, 246 million in free cash flow compared to dividends of almost 400 million. So we know now, having looked at the news releases in February and one of the reasons why the stock uh, dropped 40% was because they cut the dividend by 30%. But as an investor, looking back, uh, at the annual data, if you had just taken a high level look here, you you would have at least had a fair degree of caution about the sustainability of the dividend um, before looking to make an investment in the business. So I just wanted to point we want I wanted to point that out. So we'll now move on to some of the recent results and considerations, and we'll jump right to that February press release. So here in their website, you can jump into the news section and I find this wildly entertaining if we go to the February 21st 2018 press release you can see the title right here MIC reports 2017 financial result results increase in quarterly dividend an increase in a quarterly dividend is usually a very good thing let's click into it here I said, let's click into it. There we go. Second, second try is a charm. And we'll just scroll up to the top here. Here we go. So again, MIC reports 2017 financial results in increase in quarterly dividend. And then when you go down to the text of it, it says, in addition, we have made the decision to reduce our 2018 dividend. So I don't know if it's just a typo in the headline there. Uh, it's extremely misleading uh, to, to suggest that you're increasing your dividend when in fact you're doing the opposite. Uh, so they, they slashed their dividend from $1.44 per share and guided to about $1 a dollar a share in 2018. And a big part of that, well, not a big part of it. One part of it was that the IMTT, the bulk storage um, business, uh, announced a material loss of some storage contracts. Uh, so that was one of the operational issues that they noted. Um, but they cut the dividend by about 30%. Stock took a nosedive. And uh, that's essentially what happened in February of 2017, or 2018, sorry. Second key piece uh, of news recently is Moab Capital, I hope I pronounced that properly, uh, presumably an activist investor, subsequent to the earnings announcement, wrote a letter to the board on April 17th, claiming that management made misrepresentations that resulted in an overpayment in management fees historically, and they're asking for that to be repaid. They're also asking for a termination of the management services agreement and I did actually have that up before but I've lost it so you can you can look online and actually get a copy of that of that letter if you want uh, but obviously they are uh, disgruntled shareholders and advocating for change 
at the board level. And the last key piece is insider buying. Uh, let's go back to the news here. So insider buying. Here we go. As of May 9th, 2018, the manager owns approximately 5.8 million shares of MIC common stock. And over the last several months, management has been uh, has been buying up shares. Now, when it comes to insider buying, there's the old adage that there's many reasons to sell a stock, but only one reason to buy. This is a case that might be a slight exception to that rule, just given the fact that there is some misalignment between management and shareholders here. Their incentive and fee structure is driven by the market cap and the share price of the business. Now, while I'm sure that they they do feel that the share prices are undervalued, just keep that in mind here that their whole incentive fee and base fee structure is driven by the share price. So they could have additional uh, reasons for buying shares here to try and put a floor in the stock. Uh, again, that being said, I'm sure they do feel that that the share that the share price does not accurately or appropriately represent the value of the business. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, valuation, and let's jump into their investor presentation. So here we go. Actually, jump into so strong fundamental growth slide. So if we think about valuation, we'll look at it from an EV to EBITDA basis. And current market cap is about $4 billion. And going back to the most recent quarterly report, net debt is around 3.3 billion. So we've got a total enterprise value of four plus 3.3 or 7.3 billion. And EBITDA, they don't draw out the exact number here, but it's about 700 million. So you've got 7.3 billion in enterprise value and 700 million of EBITDA. And so if you, uh, and of course this is adjusted EBITDA excluding non-cash items, which probably includes some of that uh, uh, share dilution, but you've got about 10 times EV to EBITDA. So one other point to note, when you're looking at a business that has a fee structure arrangement like this, that valuation isn't apples to apples with other infrastructure businesses that do not have this external manager fee structure. So you can argue whether the 10 times EBITDA is good value for the assets or not, but ultimately in my view, you would have to discount the valuation given the structure here. As an equity investor in MIC, based on the fee structure and management services agreement, you're actually giving up upside uh, as an equity investor, so I shouldn't be willing to pay the same multiple, all else being equal, for these assets. Now, in a control sale of, of the assets where the management services agreement is dissolved, then they should trade sort of apples to apples. But as an investor in this vehicle, um, you want to be cautious about that and just recognize that there should be a discount on the valuation of these businesses. And for me, 10 times EBITDA, well, you can argue whether it's it's where it should be for these assets. It's not enough of a discount to get me really excited about looking into this, this one further. So with that, uh, why don't we just jump into key considerations for the stock? Here we go. So what are the strengths of, of MIC? Well, they've got a diversified group of infrastructure assets. So, you know, while half of EBITDA is generated by that uh, liquids bulk storage business, uh, they do have a couple of other assets that feed into it and uh, provide some diversification. We should acknowledge that as well that Macquarie as a sponsor has significant expertise. So, you know, I don't, I don't think there's any issue as to whether they have the expertise required to be operating uh, these assets. Risks. Uh, and we've talked a lot about it, but the external management fee structure creates misalignment with shareholders. So what do I mean by this? 
first of all, the dividends paid after the fees. Uh, so if you look at what's happened recently, the management's still getting their, their fees as calculated per the services agreement, but they've gone ahead and cut uh, the dividend by 30%. So as a shareholder, you sort of take a back seat to uh, the management fees. And the second key point that I would just raise is, would, would the management team support the sale of the business? Um, you know, is it in their best interest or would they prefer to continue to operate the assets and generate uh, these lucrative fees? Um, so again, not necessarily saying they wouldn't, uh, but as an investor, you need to think through these things and try and figure out, you know, where there's alignment and where there's potentially misalignment. Um, the second key point around the fee structure is it's punitive and dilutive to shareholders. So we talked about the fact that $500 million in fees paid over the last three years. That's relative to a business that generates $700 million in EBITDA annually. That's meaningful. That's uh, uh, quick math. That's about a quarter of your EBITDA that you've given up in fees. And lastly, leverage. Uh, credit rating, as of the most recent investor presentation, is triple B minus. So it's borderline junk. Now, I know that they've recently announced an asset sale and are working to bring leverage back in line. Uh, but just keep in mind that uh, the balance sheet as it stands right now isn't strong. Key drivers for the business. Uh, well, first off, of course, performance of the underlying assets. We didn't dive too much into that in this video because, again, going through the management fee structure, going through some of the other issues that we've discussed, um, and looking at the valuation of the business, it wasn't enough for me to want to peel back the onion further uh, with respect to the specific underlying assets. But if you were interested, if, if based on your initial analysis, you wanted to dive further. Obviously, the performance of the, the four key groups are gonna be a key driver for uh, results and the stock moving forward. Another key driver is the dilution and the cost of the management fees. Uh, just recognizing that as an investor here, you're gonna be paying those. And another, and then the lastly, reestablish management credibility. Uh, Again, Macquarie you know, has the expertise in the space that should be able to operate these assets. Um, but in the recent year, they've lost a ton of credibility by slashing the dividend after um, paying out significant management fees. And um, you know, I think if they're able to reestablish that credibility, that could be a positive catalyst for the stock. So, you know, in summary, just keep in mind, you're not really buying pure equity in its truest form here. You're buying a bit of a hybrid, so proceed with caution. Yes, you do get paid a large dividend, but your dividend, as we saw this year, comes second to the management fees and will be cut if need be. Uh, I didn't actually complete a bull, bear, and base case scenarios analysis here because, again, uh, after after our preliminary findings, I really had no interest in, in proceeding further at, at this time. So let me know what you think. Uh, am I being overly pessimistic given the fee arrangement, recent loss of management credibility? Can they earn back investor confidence? Uh, and do you think that the current dividend payout is sustainable? Let me know in the comments below. And that's a wrap on our video for MIC. Thanks for watching. Check us out at ostrichinvesting.com or on Twitter at ostrich underscore invest. We'll be back soon with more content, but until then, happy investing and don't bury your head in the sand. <laughs>